Chapter 21 of Black Magic, of the main types of the operations of the magic art, and of the powers of the Sphinx as was said in the opening of the second chapter, the single supreme ritual is the attainment of the knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel. It is the raising of the complete man in a vertical straight line. Any deviation from this line tends to become black magic. Any other operation is black magic. In the true operation the exaltation is equilibrated by an expansion in the other three arms of the cross. Hence the angel immediately gives the adept power of the four great princes and their servitors. One vidi infra. If the magician needs to perform any other operation than this, it is only lawful in so far as it is a necessary preliminary to that one work. There are, however, many shades of grey. It is not every magician who is so well armed with theory as the reader of this book. Perhaps one such may invoke Jupiter, with the wish to heal others of their physical ills. This sort of thing is harmless, tu or so. It is not evil in itself. It arises from a defect of understanding. Until the great work has been performed, it is presumptuous for the magician to pretend to understand the universe, and dictate its policy. Only the master of the temple can say whether any given act is a crime. Slay that innocent child question mark, I hear the ignorant say, what a horror exclamation mark our exclamation mark replies the knower, with foresight of history, but that child will become Nero. Hasten to strangle him exclamation mark there is a third, above these, who understands that Nero was as necessary as Julius Caesar. The master of the temple accordingly interferes not with the scheme of things except just so far as he is doing the work which he is sent to do. Why should he struggle against imprisonment, banishment, death? It is all part of the game in which he is a pawn. It was necessary for the son of man to suffer these things, and to enter into his glory. The master of the temple is so far from the man in whom he manifests that all these matters are of no importance to him. It may be of importance to his work that that man shall sit upon a throne, or be hanged. In such a case he informs his magus, who exerts the almighty power entrusted to him, and it happens accordingly. Yet all happens naturally, and of necessity, and to all appearance without a word from him. Nor will the mere master of the temple, as a rule, presume to act upon the universe, save as the servant of his own destiny. It is only the magus, he of the grade above, who has attained to chokma, wisdom, and so dare act. He must dare act, although it like him not. But he must assume the curse of his grade, as it is written in the book of the Magus. One there are, of course, entirely black forms of magic. To him who has not given every drop of his blood for the cup of Babylon all magic power is dangerous. There are even more debased and evil forms, things in themselves black such as the use of spiritual force to material ends. Christian scientists, mental healers, professional diviners, psychics and the like, are all ipso facto black magicians. They exchange gold for dross. They sell their higher powers for gross and temporary benefit. That the most grass ignorance of magic is their principal characteristic is no excuse, even if nature accepted excuses, which she does not. If you drink poison in mistake the wine, your mistake will not save your life. Below these in one sense, yet far above them in another, are the brothers of the left hand path. One these are they who shut themselves up, comic who refuse their blood to the cup, who have trampled love in the race for self aggrandizement. As far as the grade of exempt to debt, they are on the same path as the white brotherhood, for until that grade is attained, the goal is not disclosed. Then only are the goats, the lonely leaping mountain masters, separated from the gregarious huddling valley bound sheep. Then those who have well learned the lessons of the path are ready to be torn asunder, to give up their own life to the babe of the abyss which is and is not they. The others, proud in their purple, refuse. They make themselves a false crown of the horror of the abyss, they set the dispersion of Karanzna upon their brows. They clothe themselves in the poisoned robes of form, they shut themselves up, and when the force that made them what they are is exhausted, their strong towers fall, they become the eaters of dung in the day of be with us, and their shreds, strewn in the abyss, are lost. Not so the masters of the temple, 
that sit as piles of dust in the city of the pyramids, awaiting the great flame that shall consume the dust to ashes. For the blood that they have surrendered is treasured in the cup of Our Lady Babylon, a mighty medicine to awake the eld of the All-Father, and redeem the Virgin of the world from her virginity too before leaving the subject of black magic, one may touch lightly on the question of pacts with the devil. The devil does not exist. It is a false name invented by the Black Brothers to imply a unity in their ignorant muddle of dispersions. A devil who had unity would be a god. One, it was said by the sorcerer of the Jura that in order to invoke the devil, it is only necessary to call him with your whole will. This is an universal magical truth, and applies to every other being as much as to the devil. For the whole will of every man is in reality the whole will of the universe. It is, however, always easy to call up the demons, for they are always calling you, and you only have to step down to their level and fraternize with them. They will then tear you in pieces at their leisure. Not at once, they will wait until you have wholly broken the link between you and your holy guardian angel before they pounce, lest at the last minute you escape. Antony of Padua too and, in our own times, McGregor Mathers are examples of such victims. Nevertheless, every magician must firmly extend his empire to the depth of hell. My adepts stand upright, their heads above the heavens their feet below the hells. One. This is the reason why the magician who performs the operation of the sacred magic of Abramlin the mage comma immediately after attaining to the knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel, must evoke the four great princes of the evil of the world. Obedience and faith to him that liveth and triumpheth, that regneth above you in your palaces as the balance of righteousness and truth too is your duty to your holy guardian angel and the duty of the demon world to you. These powers of evil nature are wild beasts, they must be tamed, trained to the saddle and the bridle, they will bear you well. There is nothing useless in the universe, do not trap your talent in a napkin, because it is only dirty money. With regard to pacts, they are rarely lawful. There should be no bargain struck. Magic is not a trade, and no hucksters need apply. Master everything but give generously to your servants, once they have unconditionally submitted. There is also the question of alliances with various powers. These again are hardly ever allowable. Three no power which is not a microcosm in itself and even archangels rarely reach to this center of balance is fit to treat on equality with man. The proper study of mankind is God, with him is his business, and with him alone. Some magicians have hired legions of spirits for some special purpose, but it has always proved a serious mistake. The whole idea of exchange is foreign to magic. The dignity of the magician forbids compacts. The earth is the lordess and the fullness thereof. For the operations of magic art are difficult to classify, as they merge into each other, owing to the essential unity of their method and result, we may mention, 1. Operations such as evocation, in which a live spirit is brought from dead matter. 2. Operations of talismans in which a live spirit is bound into dead matter and vivifies the same. 3. Works of divination, in which a live spirit is made to control operations of the hand or brain of the magician. Such works are accordingly most dangerous, to be used only by advanced magicians, and then with great care. 4. Works of fascination such as operations of invisibility, and transformations of the apparent form of the person or thing concerned. This consists almost altogether in distracting the attention, or disturbing the judgment, of the person whom it is wished to deceive. There are, however, real transformations of the adept himself which are useful. See the Book of the Dead for the methods. The assumption of God forms can be carried to the point of actual transformation. Five works of love and hate, which are also performed, as a rule, by fascination. These works are too easy, and rarely useful. They have a nasty trick of recoiling on the magician. 6. Works of destruction, which may be done in many different ways. One may fascinate and bend to oneness will a person who has of his own right the power to destroy. One may employ spirits or talismans. The more powerful magicians of the last few centuries have employed books. In private matters these works are very easy, 
if they be necessary. An adept known to the master theory and once found it necessary to slay a sirs who was bewitching brethren. One he merely walked to the door of the room, and drew an astral T, traditor comma two and the symbol of Saturn, with an astral dagger. Within forty-eight hours she shot herself. One seven. Works of creation and dissolution, and the higher invocations. There are also hundreds of other operations semicolon two to bring wanted objects gold, books, women, and the like, to open locked doors, to discover treasure, to swim underwater, to have armed men at command etc, etc. All these are really matters of detail, the Adeptus Major will easily understand how to perform them if necessary. Three. It should be added that all these things happen naturally. Four. Perform an operation to bring gold your rich uncle dies and leaves you his money, books you see the book wanted in a catalogue that very day. Though you have advertised in vain for a year, women but if you have made the spirits bring you enough gold, this operation will become unnecessary. Five. It must further be remarked that it is absolute black magic to use any of these powers if the object can possibly be otherwise attained. If your child is drowning, you must jump and try to save him, it won't he do to invoke the undines. Nor is it lawful in all circumstances to invoke those undines even where the case is hopeless. Maybe it is necessary to you and to the child that it should die. An exempt adept on the right road will make no error here an adept major is only too likely to do so. A thorough apprehension of this book will arm adepts of every grade against all the more serious blunders incidental to their unfortunate positions. For necromancy is of sufficient importance to demand a section to itself. It is justifiable in some exceptional cases. Suppose the magician failed to obtain access to living teachers, or should he need some especial piece of knowledge which he has reason to believe died with some teacher of the past, it may be useful to evoke the shade of such a one, or read the Akasic record of his mind. One, If this be done it must be done properly very much on the lines of the evocation of Apollonius of Tyana which Eliphaz Levi performed. To the utmost care must be taken to prevent personation of the shade. It is of course easy, but can rarely be advisable, to evoke the shade of a suicide, or of one violently slain or suddenly dead. Of what use is such an operation, save to gratify curiosity or vanity? One must add a word on spiritism, which is a sort of indiscriminate necromancy one might prefer the word necrophilia by amateurs. They make themselves perfectly passive, and, so far from employing any methods of protection, deliberately invite all and sundry spirits, demons, shells of the dead, all the excrement and filth of earth and hell, to squirt their slime all over them. This invitation is readily accepted, unless a clean man be present with an aura good enough to frighten these foul denizens of the pit. No spiritualistic manifestation has ever taken place in the presence even of Fratipadurabo, how much less in that of the master theory and exclamation mark one of all the creatures he ever met, the most prominent of English spiritists, a journalist and pacifist of more than European fame, had the filthiest mind and the foulest mouth. He would break off any conversation to tell a stupid smutty story and could hardly conceive of any society assembling for any other purpose than phallic orgies comma whatever they may be. Utterly incapable of keeping to a subject, he would drag the conversation down again and again to the sole subject of which he really thought sex and sex perversions and sex and sex and sex and sex again. This was the plain result of his spiritism. All spiritists are more or less similarly afflicted. They feel dirty even across the street. Their auras are agate, muddy and malodorous, they ooze the slime of putrefying corpses. No spiritist, once he is wholly enmeshed in sentimentality and Freudian fear phantasms, is capable of concentrated thought, of persistent will, or of moral character. Devoid of every spark of the divine light which was his birthright, a prey before death to the ghastly tenants of the grave, the wretch, like Poes Monsieur of Aldma is a nearly liquid mass of loathsome, of detestable putrescence. The student of this holy magic is most earnestly warned against frequenting their seances, or even admitting them to his presence. They are as contagious as syphilis, and more deadly and disgusting. 
unless your aura is strong enough to inhibit any manifestation of the lothi love that have taken up their habitation in them, shun them as you need not mere lepers. 2 volts of the powers of Sphinx much has been written. One wisely they have been kept in the forefront of true magical instruction. Even the Tyro can always rattle off that he has to know, to dare, to will and to keep silence. It is difficult to write on this subject, for these powers are indeed comprehensive, and the interplay of one with the other becomes increasingly evident as one goes more deeply into the subject. But there is one general principle which seems worthy of special emphasis in this place. These four powers are thus complex because they are the powers of the Sphinx, that is, they are functions of a single organism. Now those who understand the growth of organisms are aware that evolution depends on adaptation to environment. If an animal which cannot swim is occasionally thrown into water, it may escape by some piece of good fortune but if it is thrown into water continuously it will drown sooner or later, unless it learns to swim. Organisms being to a certain extent elastic, they soon adapt themselves to a new environment, provided that the change is not so sudden as to destroy that elasticity. Now a change in environment involves a repeated meeting of new conditions, and if you want to adapt yourself to any given set of conditions, the best thing you can do is to place yourself cautiously and persistently among them. That is the foundation of all education. The old-fashioned pedagogues were not all so stupid as some modern educators would have us think. The principle of the system was to strike the brain a series of constantly repeated blows until the proper reaction became normal to the organism. It is not desirable to use ideas which excite interest or may come in handy later as weapons, in this fundamental training of the mind. It is much better to compel the mind to busy itself with root ideas which do not mean very much to the child, because you are not trying to excite the brain, but to drill it. For this reason, all the best minds have been trained by preliminary study of classics and mathematics. The same principle applies to the training of the body. The original exercises should be of a character to train the muscles generally to perform and kind of work, rather than to train them for some special kind of work, concentration on which will unfit them for some other tasks by depriving them of the elasticity which is the proper condition of life. One in magic and meditation this principle applies with tremendous force. It is quite useless to teach people how to perform magical operations, when it may be that such operations, when they have learned to do them, and not in accordance with their wills. What must be done is to drill the aspirant in the hard routine of the elements of the royal art. So far as mysticism is concerned, the technique is extremely simple, and has been very simply described in part one of this book four. It cannot be said too strongly that any amount of mystical success whatever is no compensation for slackness with regard to the technique. There may come a time when Samadhi itself is no part of the business of the mystic. But the character developed by the original training remains an asset. In other words, the person who has made himself a first-class brain capable of elasticity is competent to attack any problem so ever, when he who has merely specialized has got into a groove, and can no longer adapt and adjust himself to new conditions. The principle is quite universal. You do not train a violinist to play the Beethoven concerto, you train him to play every conceivable consecution of notes with perfect ease, and you keep him at the most monotonous drill possible for years and years before you allow him to go on the platform. You make of him an instrument perfectly able to adjust itself to any musical problem that may be set before him. This technique of yoga is the most important detail of all our work. The master Therian has been himself somewhat to blame in representing this technique as a value simply because it leads to the great rewards, such as Samadhi. He would have been wiser to base his teaching solely on the ground of evolution. But probably he thought of the words of the poet, you dangle a carrot in front of her nose, and she goes wherever the carrot goes. For, after all, one cannot explain the necessity of the study of Latin either to imbecile children or stupid educationalists, for, not having learned Latin, they have not developed the brains to learn anything. The Hindus, understanding these difficulties, have taken the God Almighty attitude about the matter. If you go to a Hindu teacher, he treats you as less than an earthworm. 
you have to do this, and you have to do that, and you are not allowed to know why you are doing it. One after years of experience in teaching, the master theorian is not altogether convinced that this is not the right attitude. When people begin to argue about things instead of doing them, they become absolutely impossible. Their minds begin to work it about and about, and they come out by the same door as in they went. They remain brutish, voluble, and uncomprehending. The technique of magic is just as important as that of mysticism, but here we have a very much more difficult problem, because the original unit of magic, the body of light, is already something unfamiliar to the ordinary person. Nevertheless, this body must be developed and trained with exactly the same rigid discipline as the brain in the case of mysticism. The essence of the technique of magic is the development of the body of light which must be extended to include all members of the organism and indeed of the cosmos. The most important drill practices are, 1. The fortification of the body of light by the constant use of rituals, by the assumption of God forms, and by the right use of the Eucharist. 2. The purification and consecration and exaltation of that body by the use of rituals of invocation. 3. The education of that body by experience. It must learn to travel on every plane, to break down every obstacle which may confront it. This experience must be as systematic and regular as possible, for it is of no use merely to travel to the spheres of Jupiter and Venus, or even to explore the thirty earth eyes. Neglecting unattractive meridians. One the object is to possess a body which is capable of doing easily any particular task that may lie before it. There must be no selection of special experience which appeals to one's immediate desire. One must go steadily through all the possible pylons. Fratipa Jurabo was very unfortunate in not having magical teachers to explain these things to him. He was rather encouraged in unsystematic working. Very fortunate, on the other hand, was he to have found a guru who instructed him in the proper principles of the technique of yoga, and he, having sufficient sense to recognize the universal application of these principles, was able to some extent to repair his original defects. But even to this day, despite the fact that his original inclination is much stronger towards magic than towards mysticism. He is much less competent in magic. Two at race of this can be seen even in his method of combining the two divisions of our science, for in that method he makes concentration bear the cross of the work. This is possibly an error, probably a defect, certainly an impurity of thought, and the root of it is to be found in his original bad discipline with regard to magic. If the reader will turn to the account of his astral journeys in the second number of the first volume of the Equinox, one he will find that these experiments were quite capricious. Even when, in Mexico, he got the idea of exploring the thirty earth eyes systematically, he abandoned the visions after only two earth eyes had been investigated. Very different is his record after the training in 1901 E.V. had put him in the way of discipline. Two at the conclusion of this part of this book, one may sum up the whole matter in these words, there is no object whatever worthy of attainment but the regular development of the aspirant by steady scientific work, he should not attempt to run before he can walk, he should not wish to go somewhere until he knows for certain whither he wills to go.